Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, yeah, hey, my name is Timur. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Timur underscore audio. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much to uh, Klaus, Andreas, Roland, and Lukas. I love this tradition of being part of the last uh, meetup of the year. Uh, I hope we can keep this keep this going. This is really, really interesting, um, especially with Phil um, as the other speaker of the night. Uh, actually, there is an interesting twist here this year because, as you might have noticed, my job title is Developer Advocate at JetBrains, which used to be Phil's job title until this year. So actually, Phil has now a new job, which I'm sure he will mention later. And I have actually taken over his old job at JetBrains. So I am Developer Advocate at JetBrains, and if you want to talk to me about C-Line or any other JetBrains products, then I'm the person to talk to. Um, so um, just for, very briefly want to mention this. So I was actually, um, I think we've done this either four or five times in a row now. I can't quite figure this out, but you know, quite a few times. But actually last year, I was scheduled to give a talk here uh, in December and I actually wasn't here. And so I kind of had to cancel at the last minute. And I just want to briefly mention uh, why that was. It was because on the day, on the morning of uh, the day when the meetup was supposed to happen, I have found, found out that my sister just had passed away. So I had to go there and I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't do the talk. So I'm very, very happy that this year, nothing like this is going on and I can be here and it feels, it feels really special to be here. I, this is uh, definitely one of my favorite places to um, do talks about C++ and I love this community and I'm very happy to be here. So um, now let's get to this talk uh, tonight. So. Um, I actually gave a version of this talk at CppCon uh, this year, which I was fortunate enough to attend in person. So this is not the first time I'm giving this talk, but the CppCon video is not uh, online yet. So that means um, the only place you can currently see this talk is right here, right now. Um, and the other thing I need to say um, is that I'm actually not at home in London right now. I'm currently in Athens in Greece, so I don't have my usual setup with like the multiple monitors and stuff. I only have my little notebook. And so I'm using my phone um, as like the, the switch device for my slides. So it's kind of a bit of an awkward setup. So if I keep looking down to my phone, um, then just you know what's going on. That's, that's why. I have not really done it like this before. So I hope it's going to go well. All right. Let's dive into the actual talk. The talk title is Real-Time Programming with the C++ Standard Library. But Actually, the uh, talk title is Real-Time Programming with Real-Time in quotes. And so uh, we're going to find out why that is. Um, what do we actually mean by, by real-time or this real-time in, in quotes? We're going to talk about this briefly. And uh, what does it have to do with this other uh, term that gets thrown around a lot in this context, which is low latency? So if you think of our program as kind of a pipe where, where information is flowing through, then uh, we have these like two orthogonal aspects of um, performance, basically. We have bandwidth, or like how much water is flowing through the pipe, how much data your uh, program can process per unit of time. And then we have latency, which is how much time does it take, uh, you know, when you send a request to getting a result, getting an answer. And they're kind of orthogonal aspects of how well your um, program performs. And we're not going to talk very much about bandwidth, or not at all really about bandwidth tonight, because uh, we don't really care about this, and for this talk, we're not going to process huge amounts of data like you would on a you know web server or something like this. So these are not the kind of uh, systems that we're going to be talking about tonight. But we do really care about the latency. So we're going to be talking about systems where latency is really important. And what real time really means is that we are basically putting an upper bound on um, what latency is considered to be acceptable. So. Uh, kind of first approximation of a definition of real time is that in order to be considered correct, not only does the program have to produce the correct result, but it also has to produce it within a certain amount of time. And if if that result isn't produced within that amount of time, then your program is considered to be incorrect. Um, so that's kind of what you're talking about. You will find this kind of constraint or you know this kind of issue in multiple different industries where, unsurprisingly, C++ is also very heavily used. One of them is high-frequency trading and other kind of finance applications, embedded devices, um, video games, and audio processing. And the latter is something that uh, I have spent um, in a large part of my career working in that industry. So this is kind of a little bit the perspective that I'm coming from, but I'm not going to talk about any audio-specific stuff, really. 
Um, and I hope this is going to be um, useful to a wider range of C++ developers. But um, I do have a couple of slides just on this one use case of the audio processing, just to kind of, so you know where I'm kind of coming from. Um, but this is applicable to other situations as well. So we're coming from with audio is that we want to do audio processing and we have a, a sound card, um, which is doing the kind of input and output and we get a audio callback uh, from that sound card through the kind of audio stack of our operating system, which is basically just kind of callback. It's called usually process something, something, and we get a pointer or reference or something like this to a buffer. And then if you want to play sound, we need to write some audio data into that buffer. And then we return from that process callback, and then that data is going to be in that buffer. And then uh, the sound card will essentially play back the data in there. It's going to send it out through, through the speakers. Um, and what happens is you uh, kind of audio processing happens in these buffers. So you get um, kind of an audio callback at regular intervals in time. And that typically happens on some kind of real time thread or high priority thread. And those audio callbacks come in regular intervals. And depending on uh, kind of your audio settings, um, things like buffer size and sample rate, which you can set up in your operating system, um, this uh, time between one audio callback and the subsequent one is going to be somewhere between one and 10 milliseconds. So that's kind of the time that you're working with. And we need to be done with writing our data into the buffer before the next audio callback comes around. If you don't do that, you're going to have um, garbage in the buffer and that's going to be played back through the speakers. So you're going to hear garbage. You're going to hear a glitch, a click, something like this, if you miss that deadline of one to 10 milliseconds. And that's kind of a little bit different from other low latency uh, use cases. Like it's kind of falling into a spectrum. Like for example, in trading, in high frequency trading, uh, it's about like ultra low latency. And it matters, for example, if process uh, takes one microsecond or 1.1 microsecond, right? You could lose millions of dollars if, if you're not the fastest one. In audio, it's a little bit different. Uh, you don't typically care too much about whether process is taking 10 microseconds or 11 microseconds but you do care a lot about it taking not more than these 11 microseconds 100% of the time. And they're not ever being like a single like instance where it takes 2000 microseconds all of a sudden, because that's when you're going to miss the deadline and get that glitch. And if you have one of those, nobody's going to buy your product. Um, so this is kind of what we need to achieve. This is why we have this kind of hard, hard deadline. Um, and so we have to do real-time programming. And why is real-time in quotes? Real-time is in quotes because we are not actually on a uh, real-time operating system, like something that you would have if you program an aeroplane or a, um, you know, a car or something like this. Uh, so we are not doing embedded stuff here. We're actually on a normal, regular, non-real-time operating system like Windows, Mac OS, or maybe we're on a phone, iOS, Android, et cetera. Um, so we do care about cross-platform. Um, but the, so we, we want to uh, basically be portable, but we do not control the threat scheduler here, right? Because we're not on a real-time operating system. We're on a consumer operating system. So basically what we're doing is we're just using kind of a high priority thread for the audio processing. And we hope that the operating system is going to do the right thing. It's going to schedule our high priority thread in such a way that, you know, the, the callback comes at the right time. And actually it does actually operating systems are actually really good at that. Um, if their audio stack is decently put together, which it is, you know, on these systems. So, um, so that's why real time is kind of in quotes because we're not actually on a system where the real timeness is like physically enforced, like it might do on an airplane or, or like an elevator or something like this. Uh, but we are like on a regular notebook or phone or something like this. Um, so you don't have like a deterministic threat scheduler, right? You have to kind of uh, rely on the quality of implementation of the operating system. So we do care about cross-platform. We also are on a normal consumer machine. We don't have our own special server where we control the hardware, right? It needs to run on a regular notebook that somebody has bought somewhere, right? So we don't really control what hardware is in there. And we're also using a normal C++ implementation. So we're typically on one of the three big compilers, MSVC, Clang, GCC. Uh, which also has just kind of the regular C++ standard library that everyone else is using. And the other interesting thing about audio is that only parts of the program are subject to this real-time constraint. So only what you do in this audio kind of processing uh, thread and other parts of the system like your GUI is probably not, you know, real-time. It's probably running uh, at the usual frame rate as everyone else. And if you miss a frame there once in a while, like 
nobody really notices. So, um, right. So, but we do have this kind of quote unquote real timeness here. Um, so we do have this uh, kind of audio callback, or you know, if you are in a different industry, it might be called something else. But you have this kind of physical deadline, like it can't take more than X amount of time to uh, do its thing, basically. And um, you are calling some functions in there, like here in this example, we are you know writing some audio samples and we apply maybe some gain or something. So this is doing stuff. And the question that we're asking ourselves is. Are these functions real time safe? And what we mean by that, uh, are they going to finish uh, within this? Like, is there a guarantee that they're going to finish within like a certain, you know, deterministic amount of time? Basically, can you call those functions in this process uh, callback without risking a glitch, without risking uh, missing your deadline? And so, what properties does code need to fulfill? if we are on any kind of system like this. And this could be a video game, this could be an audio processor, this could be you know, some other system with this kind of real time constraint going on. And turns out, well, what we need to make sure is that every code that you call in there, that the worst case, again, not the average case, like if you're on a web server or something, you'd care about bandwidth, you care about average case. Here, we don't care about bandwidth, you care about latency, so we care about worst case. So the worst case execution time needs to be deterministic. It needs to be known in advance, so you can put a limit on it. Um, and it needs to be independent of application data, so that shouldn't be something where the user can input some data and then the whole thing ten, takes like 10 times longer. So you don't, you don't want that. And obviously that kind of deterministic upper bound on the execution time needs to be shorter than the deadline that you actually have. And so what I should say is that this known in advance is kind of in principle, so you don't have to actually micro benchmark every single function and measure exactly how many microseconds it takes or something like this. Um, so it's enough that you know in principle that the, the worst case execution time is knowable. And uh, the other thing is that the code shouldn't fail. And what we mean by that is, you know, of course, um, code sometimes fails, but you shouldn't just throw an exception and give up. Like you need, if something goes wrong, you still need to return some reasonable result or something that you can work with still kind of within that deadline. For example, if you can't produce any sound, you have to produce silence, but you have to still do that within the deadline and not return, like not just like leave it hanging in there and then have garbage in, in the buffer. And so, um, as I said, it's enough if you um, know kind of the upper bound on your execution time in principle and uh, often, actually, um, what that means is you don't have to, as I said, benchmark every function, but you can look at the function. And from that, you can kind of infer whether this function has this property of real-time safe by looking at you know, what it does and certain properties that it has. And what properties are these? So you don't want to call anything that might uh, block, because as soon as you uh, block the thread, obviously, you have this kind of non-deterministic execution time. Uh, you don't know when it's going to resume again. It's not in your control. And also you get this other problem that you get priority inversion, which means if you're waiting higher priority thread, sorry, if you're on a high priority thread, you're waiting on a lower priority thread, then effectively, you know, your high priority thread will actually get kind of that lower priority of the thing that it's waiting on. So you get this kind of priority inversion problem. Um, so you can't do anything that might block, which means you can't try to acquire a mutex you can't do anything like this. You can't allocate or deallocate memory. You can't do any input output um, because that's also going to not have a deterministic execution time. You can't really interact with a threat scheduler like in any way. You can't do any other system calls because you don't know what's going on there. You don't know how long that's going to take. And you can't really also call any third party code if you don't know exactly what's going on inside and whether or not it, it has these properties. So something which is kind of a little bit different, which is um, if you use algorithms in there, if you do call third party code, it does something, you need to make sure that it has constant time complexity. Like it's not going to take, you know, it's not going to scale somehow. Um, you know, it's, it's always going to take roughly the same amount of time. And uh, a very subtle point is that it also you can't also use algorithms with amortized constant complexity. Like a typical example for this would be inserting into a hash map, which most of the time takes you know 
one complex uh, time, but every once in a while the hash map says, oh no, I have a hash collision, I need to rehash everything. And you don't want that to happen when you're on that kind of deadline. So you can't use anything that's amortized constant time. Um, so this is kind of, these are kind of properties that our code needs to fulfill in order to be considered real time safe. Now, um, some of you might think, ha, huh, isn't that the same as freestanding C++? I don't know how many of you have followed this kind of stuff, but it's a proposal uh, or actually quite a series of proposals um, by Ben Craig, uh, who's trying to basically carve out um, a subset of the C++ language and the C++ library, which is safe to use on kind of embedded, um, not just embedded, but bare metal freestanding systems where you don't have an operating system, you don't have threads. Like what subset of the language can you use in such an environment? And there's like a whole uh, series of proposals. He's done quite a lot of work trying to define what that subset of C++ actually is. So if you look at that uh, subset of the language, though, it's not quite the same thing as the real-time safe that we're talking about. So um, this is a very oversimplified Venn diagram. Um, you know, there is quite a lot of overlap. So in both kind of bare metal freestanding systems and in a kind of real-time safe system like audio processing or a video game or something like this uh, on the kind of where you're doing the, the kind of work that needs to be real-time safe you can't use any locks you can't use any operating system calls you can't allocate your allocate memory you can't throw exception you can't do io but on the freestanding side of things um, you also um, typically these um, you know systems they might not have floating point numbers you know some bare metal embedded systems chips don't have floating point numbers and they don't have a heap um, whereas uh, if you're doing this on a normal machine you do have these things but on the other hand you can't call anything that's not constant time and then I guess the biggest difference is that if you're on a freestanding uh, environment those things in that Venn diagram they do not exist you do not have them right the implementation does not offer them to you the platform doesn't have them whereas if you're trying to write real-time safe software for consumer machines you do have those things you know you can use a mutex or a call malloc or call new something but you're not supposed to right so it's 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 a you know, it's a big difference so um, this is a very long introduction <laughs> and there are actually um, quite a few other talks both by myself and other people who know a lot about this stuff um, probably more than me uh, <laughs> um, who talk just about how to program in this way um, and we're not going to repeat any of those talks here so I'm not going to talk about you know how to program in this way this talk is about a different question or the remainder of this talk is about a different question which is what subset of the C++ standard library is real-time safe? So if you are on a normal you know, uh, implementation of C++, like MSVC, GCC, Clang, and you just take the C++ standard library as is, which bits of it are real-time safe? Which fulfill these um, kind of properties? And obviously, we don't, we're not going to have time to go through every function in the standard library and every class in the standard library, because you only have an hour or so in total. And I've only burned through something like 15 minutes of that. So um, we're not going to have time to do that. But I will mention a few particularly common um, and interesting cases. And I'll tell you um, how to squint at the C++ standard in such a way that you can kind of figure out the rest on your own. And you kind of get a feeling for which bits of the C++ standard library are real-time safe and which are not. And this is kind of really the goal of this talk. So if you do um, look at the C++ standard library and the standard document, which defines what it does, turns out that the C++ standard says nothing about execution time. It's not going to say this function is guaranteed to take, you know, less than X milliseconds, nothing like that. It doesn't actually have any concept of physical time, uh, like the kind of in terms of like how long execution takes. And also the C++ standard doesn't say anything about this function doesn't allocate memory. Um, you can kind of infer from the specification that allocations are not needed to implement that function. And then you kind of have to trust the quality of implementation that, you know, that's what's going on. And, you know, your compiler vendor has chosen, you know, the optimal implementation, which they do because they're very smart people and they know how to implement the standard library. Um, and sometimes the C++ standard does help you a little bit because there are some useful sentences like, F might invalidate iterators, which gives you a hint of, okay, it's going to probably like reallocate stuff and, you know, put it somewhere else. Or 
if there is enough memory, F does this, otherwise it does that, which again tells you, okay, if it's not enough memory, it's probably going to try to allocate more memory and you don't want that. So you find these kind of like little sentences in the standard. Um, see what the standard also doesn't say, X doesn't use locks, it doesn't say that. But it does say X may not be accessed from multiple threads simultaneously, which gives you a hint that, okay, well then it doesn't have locks because it's not synchronized, so it's probably safe uh, to assume that it's not going to uh, like try to acquire a lock uh, and it's probably safe or otherwise um, the standard might say x may not introduce data races which means you know it is threat safe which means it's probably going to have locks inside and you probably don't want to go anywhere near x uh, whatever utility that is but yeah again like to a large extent um, you have to trust that you know the Standard library implements things in a reasonable way. We have to trust the quality of implementation of the standard library just in the same way um, like we need to trust the quality of implementation of our operating system to get the threat scheduler right because we also don't have any control over that. Um, all right, so let's dig in. Let's talk about actual features and actual things that are in a standard library. The first thing is um, exceptions. Now, exceptions to the surprise of hopefully absolutely nobody are not real-time save. Um, and a lot of the standard library actually uses exception. Uh, so, you know, don't do things that throw exceptions. There is actually um, work being done to um, change this. So there is this proposal from Herb Sutter, which is from a little bit more than two years ago now. Um, people have done talks uh, about this, I think. Um, so obviously Herb himself and I think also Phil, who is going to give the next talk also, um, have has done a few talks on this subject. Um, I'm not going to dive into this um, for what we're talking about right here. Uh, the only important bit of the standard, um, sorry, the only important bit of this paper is this. Uh, it talks about the status quo today. It says that today's dynamic exception types do not have statically boundable time costs. In particular, throw requires dynamic allocation. So we don't have any idea whether or not kind of this proposal is ever going to make it in the standard, but right now, you know, it requires a location, can't use this, not real-time safe. So we don't really have to talk about exceptions anymore, except there is this one subtlety which um, turns out to be actually quite deep. So a um, um, friend and former colleague of mine, uh, Fabian Renjal, who also has done talks about this kind of stuff, um, actually asked me a question. He said, okay, it's not real-time safe to throw an exception, but is it real-time safe um, to basically have a try block and then, you know, enter and leave that try block if you don't throw any exceptions. I was like, hmm, I don't actually know. Um, and that um, turned out to be quite a rabbit hole, um, but I actually dug into this and uh, learned quite a lot about this. So um, turns out it depends on how um, exceptions are implemented and that depends on the ABI. Uh, so basically there are kind of you know, very oversimplified, and I'm actually not an expert on this particular thing, but uh, from kind of what I understand, there are basically two um, ways in which you can implement exceptions. One, so because you do need info, so if you throw an exception in the middle of a function, you need to unwind the stack, you need to know where to, you know, put the exception into and how to like go back. And so this needs additional information, right? You need to store additional information about like what variables you have and, you know, where the exception goes and things like that. So you can unwind all of this. And the question is, where does this, um, so when and where is this information, this additional information generated? And so um, you can either like basically generate it upfront and put it in some kind of static table. And then if you throw an exception, you just look up, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, or you can basically generate this info at runtime. Like if you enter a try block, that's when you start generating this data structure. And turns out both both approaches are used. Um, the vast majority of modern platforms use the former approach, which is everything is you know, generated statically upfront, which is also co called the zero cost exception model. That's what um, you know the Atenium ABI does, so DC and Clang. That's what Windows 64-bit does. That's what the ARM ABI does on both 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, there is also Windows 32-bit, which is using the um, other approach where basically you do generate um, the exception information at runtime and where there's like quite a considerable uh, amount of, um, you know, it's not, it's measurable, let's say, like the order of like 
a few percent. Um, kind of a, there's measurable runtime overhead of entering a try block, even if you never throw an exception. So that's the case. That's kind of the default exception handling mechanism on Windows 32-bit. But um, then I kind of looked into uh, what this does, and it seems to uh, basically um, write a bunch of uh, data into some thread local, uh, um, you know, places memory, thread local memory, write some stuff into registers. So even there, there's nothing going on that would allocate mem dynamic memory or like lock a mutex or anything like that. So uh, kind of the first category, um, there is basically no cost to a try block if you don't throw. Um, I mean, it's not quite true because the presence of a try block might interfere with exactly how optimization is going to, you know, transmute your code and things like that. But to a, to a like first order approximation, the first category of ABIs, you're not going to have an overhead um, of throwing an exception as long as you don't actually, sorry, you're not going to have an overhead of entering and leaving a try block if you don't actually throw an exception. In the second uh, case, which is Windows 32-bit, you are going to have an overhead even if you don't throw just by the presence of try-catch. But it's still real-time safe because you're not doing anything in there that's not real-time safe, um, as far as I can tell. So the answer to this question, is it real-time safe to you know, use a try block if you don't throw? And the answer is yes. And if you want a lot more information about this with benchmarks and everything, there's a great paper by Ben Craig um, called um, Error Speed Benchmarking, uh, which you can find on wg21.link slash p1886. So I encourage you to check that out if you're interested in that. OK, we talked about exceptions. Uh, what else is there? Let's talk about SDL algorithms. Now, there's quite a lot of algorithms in the SDL um, header algorithm. What, which of those are real-time safe? Is std sort real-time safe? Is std rotate real-time safe? And uh, we assume here actually that the element type that you're working with and the um, kind of iterator type that you're working with, that they're real-time safe, right? So obviously if the element type of your range is something like a std string, you know, which allocates memory when you copy it or and you're trying to copy them or, um, you know, if if you if your iterator is like back insert iterator vector, which is going to call pushback, or OSTIM iterator, which is going to do I/O, then obviously you know it's not going to be real time safe. We assume that you know our elements and our iterators are real time safe. So you have something like vector of int or whatever, um, and we, we like you know apply the STL algorithm on on that. And then the question is: Is there going to be a memory allocation inside the actual algorithm? And of course, the standard doesn't say. Uh, but it turns out that for almost all of these algorithms, uh, an optimal implementation of the specification doesn't require additional allocations. So um, a few algorithms actually can be implemented faster if they're allowed to allocate something like a temporary buffer. Uh, so they will do that. So that is dynamic allocation, if they can. But the good thing about this is that you can spot them in the standard. So whenever you have an algorithm like this, you're going to find these magic words in the standard specification saying, if enough extra memory is available, the algorithm does this, and otherwise it does that, like here. And so whenever you see this, you know it's going to try and allocate memory. Stay away from that algorithm if you have a deadline. And luckily, there are actually only three of them, which is stable sort, stable partition, and in-place merge. So out of these three, stable sort is probably the one that someone would most likely end up using. Like I've actually seen this somewhere in a kind of a more complicated audio engine, for example, you would imagine somebody would want to use stable sort. So don't do that. That is not real-time safe. And obviously all the parallel um, algorithms are also not real-time safe because they're you know dealing with multiple threads and things like that. Everything else in header algorithm is fine. Okay, I actually realized that I've been talking for quite a lot, and maybe people have questions about some of the stuff that I've mentioned so far. So, Klaus, do you know if there's any questions on the chat? There is indeed a couple of questions. Um, so, for slide 17, we have a question. Right. Yes. So, I'm just reading it. Uh, may I use... Oh, I don't see it properly. Give me a second. 
May I use lock free constructs? Example given memory barriers, compare and swap. Uh, yeah, so so this is the whole point of lock-free programming, that you can actually do that. And I, I'll get to that later. I, I'll mention it briefly. So we, we'll get to that. OK, perfect. Then um, slide 20. CP Pal has a question. Uh, so unlike freestyle, um, you can use a heap on uh, real-time safe, but must pre-allocate everything in advance? Yes, we're going to get to allocations. There's a whole section about allocations. But yes, you can use std vector or whatever, as long as you do the actual allocation up front. And when you do your processing or, you know, whatever it is, if you like actually then playing the game and the level is running and you have monsters running around, you're not going to do a pushback into that vector at that point, you know, on that on that thread, thread basically. So there is a heap, you can access it, but you can't allocate, like if you're in that thread, that, that's on a deadline, yes. All right. And Manuel has a question. How do you deal with the C++ standard library? So uh, example given libs to C++ or libc++ that was built with uh, slash f, uh, dash f exceptions by the RTOS vendor. Uh, so it can throw, for example, to bad alloc, but you want to build your code with f no exceptions. Right. So bad alloc is a little bit of a special case because if if you run out of dynamic memory, you're screwed anyway. Like it doesn't matter at that point if if you throw because your program is not going to probably do anything useful at that point. So I think bad alloc is kind of a bad example. I think it's fine to throw bad alloc in that context because you know what can you do if you run out of memory? Like yeah. you should probably just terminate the whole thing, right? It's, and it's not even really recoverable in a general case. Um, if you throw other kinds of exceptions, then yeah, don't. Basically, don't call anything that might throw. Basically, you know, like for example, um, yeah, I can't think of a good example right now. Maybe I can think of one later. But um, okay, perfect. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, so thank you. This this was all the questions so far. All right. So where were we? We talked about uh, exceptions. We, I just realized um, if you're going to do this question thing, it's probably going to take a little bit more than an, an hour. The whole thing. So. Uh, I hope that's fine. That's perfect. Um, um, right. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. We talked about algorithms. Right. OK, what about STL containers? That's the next thing, right? We have algorithms, we have containers. Uh, so obviously, std array is on the stack, so that's real-time safe, except, again, there are functions that can throw, like at. at uh, like it can throw an out-of-bounds exception. So don't call at. Like, this is a good example, actually, for the previous question. Don't call at, call you know operator square bracket instead, and you know check up front that if you have to check that you're within the range, do that up front yourself. Don't call at, which might throw an exception. So that I think answers the previous question. Anyway, um, so std array is fine because it's just on a stack. Uh, all other STL containers, unfortunately, use dynamic memory, so they are not real time safe. Uh, unless you kind of use this like subset, which is guaranteed to be um, real-time safe, like std vector, you can index into it, but you can't create one. You can't push back into one. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can't do with it. So by default, everything apart from std array is is not real-time safe, or at least not out of the box. So, but what if you like dynamically sized containers are a pretty important thing that comes up a lot when you want to do anything meaningful. Uh, in a program. So what if you do need a dynamically sized container on the real-time thread? What do you do? So you have a few options. One thing that I've seen a lot of audio kind of DSP people specifically do is um, use a variable length array, which is just an array on the stack, but with a kind of dynamic size. So you can do that, uh, which is going to work great on Clang and GCC, and it's also going to work great in, on, in C, but in C++ on Windows, it's going to give you um, an error because surprise, surprise, uh, variable length arrays are actually not part of the C++ standard. There are um, a vendor extension, which Windows doesn't support. So it's not standard C++ to do this. Um, and um, I actually had once a code base of an, uh, like a bunch of really good sounding audio algorithms from like a vendor, um, which we wanted to use for a product that we were making, but it was full of these VLAs and um, uh, when I tried to, um, you know, compile the code on Windows, it just all completely fell apart, and I had to spend the whole day just replacing every VLA manually by um, 
uh, by something else. And it was really quite painful. So please don't do that. Please use standard C++. Thank you. Um, OK, so we can't do this. We still need a dynamic container. So you know maybe we can use a custom allocator. OK, cool. Um, what custom allocators are out there? And um, turns out that, yeah, there are a bunch. There is like, um, you know, TC malloc, which is like the Google one. There's RP malloc, which is um, also a pretty good allocator. And they're all a lot more efficient than, than you know, the normal malloc that comes with your standard library. And they've all, you know, been written by very, very smart people. Um, but unfortunately, all of them, at least all of the ones that I'm aware of, uh, they're optimizing for the average case. They're written for this use case of you have a web server, you want to make malloc and operate a new, you know, as cheap as possible on average because you care about bandwidth, you care about, you know, average execution time. Uh, and none of them, as far as I can tell, are optimized for the worst case and, and are written in a way that, you know, there's a boundary on the worst case. And of course, you know, they do have some kind of like internal structures, but like eventually they will run out of that and they will then all go to the operating system to request more dynamic memory. And that's when kind of, you just can't do that in principle if you're on a real time threat, you just can't. So um, all of them are basically not, not real time safe. Um, yeah, as I said, they're minimizing average cost, not worst case. They're not constant time, right? So they're not, they're not like, depending on what state your system is in, like a call to any of those allocators is going to not take the same time every time. Uh, once in a while, it might take a lot longer. They're also multi-threaded. Typically, they have locks, um, and they all eventually go to the operating system. Um, so what we want is you want a real-time safe allocator, which is constant time, which is single-threaded, and which only uses memory that we've already allocated up front and will never, ever actually go to the operating system to request more memory. Okay, so this is what we want if you want to use, you know, std vector with a custom allocator in a, in a real time thread. Good news. Turns out we do have not only one, but multiple such real time safe allocators in the standard library today. Isn't that awesome? Uh, let's uh, quickly go through that. Um, we have something that's called std PMR monotonic buffer resource, and that has been in the standard since C17. And what it does is um, basically you give it a um, of upfront allocated uh, memory, like in this case, it's the stack memory and you just give it like data and a size. So it's kind of wraps that. And what it does with it is whenever you try to allocate uh, memory um, from that um, monotonic buffer resource, it's gonna give you a chunk uh, from that, you know, memory pool and not memory pool from that upfront allocated memory. So it's gonna give you a chunk and advance the head pointer. And then next time it's gonna give you a chunk and advance the head pointer. And it's gonna do that until it, it runs out um, and deallocate is just not doing anything. And then when it's at the end, it's going to then uh, go to what we call an upstream iterator, uh, sorry, upstream allocator, which is I ran out of memory. This like pre-allocated memory is, is finished. And it's going to request um, more memory, but you can actually configure um, where that happens. Um, and that is the third argument. So that's kind of the upstream iterator. That's kind of the fallback um, upstream, sorry, upstream, uh, allocator, which is the fallback. And uh, we're going to give it another allocator in the standard library, which is the null memory resource. And that's a really stupid allocator that just does nothing and, you know, never ever allocates any memory, but just gives up, um, you know, whenever, um, whenever you're out of memory. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And you can do this. You can then basically uh, use this allocator uh, it's called a memory resource. You can then create an actual allocator object, and then you give it that memory resource. And then you can create a std PMR vector, uh, and then you can give it that allocator um, at runtime. Or you can also do it at compile time by using std vector float comma allocator, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's two allocators that we have in the standard library. And then we have a third one. Um, oh, I should say this. It's going to be real time safe and it's also going to be very, very cache friendly, right? Because the whole uh, kind of buffer is, is just one chunk of memory, which is on the stack or it might be on the heap, but it's, it's kind of one block, right? So it's going to be very close together memory. That's good. You want that. Um, 
so this is kind of cool. I actually checked with uh, Pablo Halpan, who is the author of the STED PMR proposal uh, when I was at CPVCon to make sure this is definitely real-time safe the way it's specified and typically implemented. Yes, it is. And there's even a third allocator in the standard library, which is also real-time safe if it's implemented correctly anyway. Uh, it's called STED PMR unsynchronized pool resource. And that's really, really cool. So basically that's what you can use if you want a real-time safe allocator that um, uh, basically can handle different sizes of allocation. Like if you're requesting blocks of like different sizes. So it has this uh, somewhat complex internal structure where it has these chunks um, and then chunks of a certain size are like in a pool. And so you have one pool per size of allocation that you might request. And then you have a bunch of these pools and it's kind of handling all that. Um, and if you uh, ask it for a block, it's going to see, okay, do I have, what's the pool for the size that you're requesting? What's the kind of chunk, uh, the, the kind of latest chunk where I have some free blocks and it's going to give you a block from that. So there's some overhead in space because there's all this bookkeeping going on and there's some overhead in, in um, time as well, be, you know, uh, compared to the monotonic buffer resource, but it's still pretty lightweight and it's, it's allocation is constant time if it's implemented correctly. Um, and the advantage of this is also that because it has this like linked list of chunks, I can actually deallocate memory as well. So it can kind of recycle uh, memory if you deallocate. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, what was the next thing I was wanted to talk about? Um, you can create one of those things. Um, and yes, so what it does if it actually runs out of blocks, it, again, it goes to an upstream iterator. So what you can do is you can give it the thing that it's going to do this pool on. You can give it just the monotonic buffer again. And then, you know, the monotonic buffer has a null memory resource as um, its fallback. So you know that this whole thing is never going to go to the operating system and actually allocate memory. So it's all, it's all fine. And that's really pretty cool if you have kind of a more complex problem. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, handle, you know, dynamic scratch buffers of different sizes in your real-time system. This is this is the right thing to do if you don't want to code something yourself. But if you just want a real-time safe vector where like the elements are all of the same size, um, PMR vector with this and even PMR vector with monotonic buffer resource is um, quite uh, quite some 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 overkill. Um, oh yeah, I should say. Um, yeah. Um, so if you have a vector, uh, it's a much better uh, idea to um, actually use something like a static vector, which isn't in a standard library yet. Um, so, what a static vector, um, what a static vector is, is basically um, it's a vector where, um, like, the it has a constant capacity, which is allocated up front. It's actually on the stack inside the actual vector itself. So there is no heap involved at any point. Um, and that's smaller, that's faster because there's no indirection. Um, and also there's no need to construct an allocator um, kind of outside of the vector. It gets kind of weird. Like if you have a vector and then a PMR vector and like an allocator, it's kind of a separate object. It has a separate lifetime. The vector is kind of a value type. The allocator is kind of a reference type. It, it kind of gets a little bit messy. So we can avoid all that by using this kind of stack vector or static vector, uh, which unfortunately isn't in the standard library, but um, you know, there's a proposal PO843 to uh, put it in the standard library. So hopefully we will get it at some point in the future. And there's also actually a very good talk by David Stone um, called Implement Static Vector, where he talks about how to implement those things correctly. Okay, that's all I have about uh, containers specifically. Is there, are there any questions at this point? New question. Okay, so good. Please, then, let's go on, thank you. Okay, so we talked about containers. Let's talk about utilities. We have a bunch of other utilities in the standard library. Um, we obviously have the pair and the tuple, which are on the stack. So they're real time safe. Again, unless you call something that you can throw. We have std optional, which is just a value in a bool, which is also on the stack. So that's also real time safe. Uh, and again, just don't call, you know, a function that can throw std bad optional access. Don't do that. But like 90% of the API is not throwing anything. So that's Fine, safe to use. It's just on the stack. And then it's the variant, um, which is just the union on the stack, right, under the hood. So it ought to be real-time safe as well. But 
Variant is actually really interesting because whether or not Variant is uh, real-time safe actually depends on exactly how you specify it. And it turns out um, std Variant in the standard library is real-time safe, but Boost Variant, which you know has a very, very similar API, is not uh, real-time safe. And uh, this is kind of a, a um, kind of one of those instances where exactly kind of the details of how you specify something and how you design the API actually affect whether or not you can implement this in a real-time safe way. And in particular with variant, like the interesting thing is, if you have um, something, um, if you basically while you try to write a value in the variant, that operation throws. What happens then? That's kind of the question. So let's um, say we have this toy uh, kind of type uh, for the sake of example, uh, which just throws whenever you try to construct one of them. And then uh, you have a variant of int and one of those things, and you write an int into it, and then, OK, fine, var now holds an int and has the value 42. Uh, but what happens if you try to put one of those you know, throw thingies in there? And obviously, the constructor fails because it throws an exception. Um, the question is, what value does var hold now? And uh, basically after that line of code. And then boost variant actually had this thing that's called a strong exception guarantee, which for example, std vector also has. Like if you try to push back into a vector and that throws, you're guaranteed to have the same vector as you had before you tried to do the thing. And boost variant has the same guarantee if you are trying to write something into the variant, um, but that throws, um, then it's guaranteed to just have the previous value. So in this case, the variant would still hold the value 42. And then um, basically the way they implement that is that you uh, allocate a temporary buffer uh, where you kind of back up the old value. And then if the new value throws, then you kind of recover the old value and write it back into the variant. But that temporary buffer, unfortunately, requires a memory allocation, right? Because it's dynamic and um, then that is not real-time safe. So that's why boost variant is going to not be real-time safe, right? Because it has this kind of temporary backup which happens on the heap. Now, the std variant has a slightly different uh, specification. It doesn't have the strong exception guarantee. So um, if you emplace or you know, write into a std variant, it's never going to allocate on the heap, which is good which means you can't roll the value back if that throws, um, which means um, you can't recover the value. And what std variant does is it has then just this kind of special value, valueless by exception, which means, well, something through an exception, I don't have a value now. And that is the thing that um, in the standard that allows to implement std variant in a way that's real-time safe, which is great because std variant is very, very useful, and I'm very happy that I can use it on the real-time thread. All right, um, some other utilities uh, we have in the standard library. Um, all of them that are using some form of type erasure um, are not real-time safe because type erasure always involves heap allocation. So that um, involves std any, which allocates on the heap. It's also std function, also using type erasure, also allocates on the heap. So std function is actually interesting because it was supposed to be allocator aware. So initially in C++11, like there was a way to give a std function like a custom allocator, but that never really worked. No standard library vendor actually implemented that properly um, because it's not really, it doesn't really work in practice. So in C++17, the allocator support for std function actually got removed again. Um, so you can't use any of these. Um, there is actually a um, somewhere, I think, on the SG14 uh, forum, which is a sub, sub study group of the C++ um, Senate committee. Uh, there is a proposal or even an implementation, I think, of something like called an in-place function, which is kind of a std function-like uh, class that stores everything kind of on the stack. So it means that like with a fixed vector, there's like a capacity limit. If you try to store something that doesn't fit, it doesn't work. But that's kind of a real-time safe alternative. Um, but that's not in a standard library. All right, uh, do we have any questions about kind of utilities um, at this point? Question. Um, what exactly is static, is, uh, um, a static vector is in comparison to a std array? So std array has a fixed size. Static vector has a 
dynamic size, but a fixed capacity. Capacity means, you know, how like the maximum size that it can have. Like in, on a std vector, the capacity is um, dynamic, right? Whenever you want to push back and you run out of capacity, you can allocate a new block of memory and to increase the capacity and then you keep pushing back. Uh, a fixed vector or static vector um, doesn't have that. So you can increase its size, but only up to a certain point. All right, perfect. Thank you. That, that's it. And that's kind of, that is determined by how much you have free allocated up front, right? Or like on the stack typically, but you can also do it on a heap. All right, should we keep going? Right, so uh, lambdas. I know it's not really a standard library feature, but I'm, I kind of need to mention this here because I need to dispel a myth. Um, because there is a, like some people in the audio industry that I have worked with, and I think maybe also in video games and other places, I don't know. There is this kind of myth that if you create a lambda, somehow that might allocate dynamic memory, and so that's not safe to use. So I just want to make that clear. That's not true. Lambdas are not going to normally allocate anything on the heap. Um, so lambdas are safe to use. If you have something like this, um, you create a lambda on the stack, it's going to only use stack memory. That is never ever going to um, allocate dynamic memory unless you capture something by value, which then needs to be copied into the lambda. And that thing, like a std string, for example, uh, if you copy it, that allocates memory, right? So if you capture the string by value in a lambda, that will allocate. But the creation of the lambda itself um, it's not going to allocate anything. So in this example, we are capturing something by value. We are making a copy of the std array, but the std array is on the stack, so the copy is also going to be on the stack. So that is always going to be real time safe. Of course, if you then you know pass that lambda itself into another function, which is then doing something with that lambda by calling it, uh, you really want to make sure that you don't you know pass this. Uh, lambda as a std function that do something doesn't have std function um, in its signature um, because that again will then allocate memory because of std function. What you want to do instead is you want to template do something on a type of function. So you want to make it a function template uh, and then you want to use the actual type of the lambda and pass that in and then that's going to be real time safe. So we covered Lambdas, there is another new type of function uh, in the C20 standard, coroutines, uh, which are kind of also like functions and lambdas, except they are more powerful. Um, they're really cool. Um, they can actually suspend and resume, so you can like jump out of the middle of a function and jump back in. So you can write things like that. Uh, this is just a coroutine that generates uh, basically the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3. So what happens here is that uh, we have this loop, and then in the loop it it co yields. Um, I actually just saw that Apple Keynote for some reason uh, capitalized the i. Um, that must be the auto correction which I forgot to uncorrect. So apologies for that. That is supposed to be a uh, lowercase i, of course. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, that's going to in the loop. It's going to return the next value, and then the next time you call it, it's going to just jump back into the loop and then return the next value. So effectively, every time you call this function, it's going to return uh, the next number. So that's really cool, um, really cool utility um, in C++ 20. Very, very powerful language feature. Um, so how do we use this? We uh, generate the core routine like this, and then um, that's going to return you a generator object, and then you can uh, you know call that or do something with it. Um, and now uh, the bad news is that in general uh, that actually may perform a dynamic allocation. So it's different from lambdas. Uh, so if you uh, are creating a coroutine, you are creating what's called a coroutine frame, which internally holds like all the local variables of the of coroutine and everything. And that, you know, you might not know at compile time how large that is. Um, so that's going to be dynamically allocated. So a coroutine is essentially some kind of type erased kind of thing under the hood. And so in general, creating a coroutine will allocate heap memory. So that's not real time safe. So in a simple case like this, uh, if the compiler can see through the whole coroutine and all instances where it's being called, um, it can typically optimize away uh, that allocation and it's allowed to do that. In this case, you're probably not going to get a dynamic allocation, but in general you will, there's no guarantee. 
So you can't really um, use that. So what are your options if you want to use coroutines? You can rely on the optimizer to optimize that out. And there is a talk by Eyal Sadaka at CPPCon this year. Um, there was this talk. Um, and he goes into the details of how far you can actually get with this. Um, and it turns out very, very far. You can convince the optimizer to optimize out this allocation in quite a lot of cases. But you need to look at the assembly that you get generated, right? You need to know what platform you're on, what compiler you're on. It's not portable, right? So that's not really an option for portable code uh, where you kind of don't control the platform or you don't know exactly what, what your optimizer is going to be doing. Um, the other option you have is uh, you can create uh, the coroutine frame kind of upfront and then suspend it and then just call it on the real-time thread. And that is a strategy that might work. I have to admit I, I have not used this in, in practice yet. Um, so let's you know wait a little bit and see like more people are going to use coroutines come up with these kind of patterns. We're going to see if that's actually kind of usable and practice that approach. But obviously, you need to be careful with that. Excuse me. Um, one thing that you can do, which is kind of a bit more involved, if you're kind of more into coroutines. So a coroutine has this thing called a promise type. Um, and then you can write your own promise type, um, which basically is the thing that kind of defines like how you get you know data in and out of the coroutine and how the coroutine behaves and things like that. And in there, you can define your own custom operator, new and operator delete. So it's kind of a very roundabout way to kind of, you know, uh, allocate the coroutine in, in a custom way, which then might be real time safe. So this is quite involved. You can Google it. There is an example somewhere, I think, in Lewis's Baker's website, maybe somewhere. Um, it's quite involved. I have also not tried to do this myself because um, I think I would just get it wrong. Um, uh, so the option that I kind of chose is um, kind of unfortunate, but um, yeah, I just don't use coroutines on a real-time thread because they're just not portably real-time safe, unfortunately. Right, um, any questions about lambdas and coroutines and things like that? Uh, Phil, ask a question. Um, so IRSC, um, there was a proposal so not sure if it made it in for C plus twenty three for a compile time check to see if a coroutine requ would require an allocation or not. Do you know whether that made it in? Ooh, I have not followed that uh, recently. So I remember when we were discussing coroutines in the C plus plus committee that was around like two thousand eighteen, mm -hmm. uh, early two thousand nineteen, when there was a lot of debate about how exactly to specify this and how to put this into the standard. There was this paper by actually Gore Nishanov himself um, who proposed something like this. And I think there was another paper talking about this. We looked at them, but there kind of just wasn't time to uh, um, kind of get that right. If that idea kind of is still in flight, I'm interested in that. Um, I think that would be really cool. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not up to date. I'm going to literally after this talk, uh, look this up and see uh, if that kind of idea is still in flight, because I think that would be very useful. All right. That's it. Thank you. All right. So we talked about lambdas and quarantines. What's next? C++ has a very, very big and comprehensive library for synchronization, threat synchronization, and you know, concurrency and things like that. And there have been books written about this, and it's really cool stuff. Um, so we have, obviously, mutexes, um, locks. We had them since C++ 11, and condition variables. Then in C20, we actually get a lot more stuff. We have semaphores, latches, and barriers now in the standard in C20, which is really cool. Unfortunately, none of this is uh, portably real-time safe because any all of these utilities, they will you know, interact with the threat scheduler in some way or another, right? So none of them are portably real-time safe. And um, people actually get this wrong. Um, like um, one example that I have seen in production code, um, people were saying, OK, well, we can't lock a mutex. So this is, again, a process callback. We are in the real-time environment here right now. And people say, um, OK, I can't lock a lock, right? Because I'm going to be blocking and stuff. But I can try to lock. Right? That's fine, right? That's real-time safe. So the specification says, if you try to lock, it's going to just check if the mutex is available. If it's available, you acquire it immediately. If it's not available, you do nothing and return false, right? So um, that is real-time safe, right? And the answer is yes, the try to lock itself is real-time safe. 
But uh, that brace, when you get to that brace, then you're doomed because if you actually succeeded to acquire the lock on the real-time thread and you do some processing, you do some stuff, and then at the same time, another thread tries to acquire that lock, right? So on the real-time, the pattern is on the real-time thread, you're doing try to lock, and then the non-real-time thread, like GUI or network or something, uh, you do the, uh, a lock, you do, you, you do the weight, right? You do the blocking weight. And so if that happens while you own the lock in the, in the real-time thread, then once you're done, once you hit that closing brace, you need to wake up the other thread to tell it, hey, you can have the lock now, right? And that's going to uh, interact with the thread scheduler. That's going to interact with the kind of whole threading thing. And that is not portably real-time safe, so you cannot do this. And um, it's interesting because I, I actually wrote a blog post about this at some point, and there was like a Linux expert who said, well, actually, you know, in the Linux kernel, this is kind of sort of fine for very complicated reasons that I didn't understand. But then there was another Linux expert, expert saying, no, that's not actually true. It's not real-time safe. Here's a paper about this. Like it's implemented with few texts under the hood and like blah, 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 blah. So they couldn't agree on whether it was real-time safe in Linux where the whole kernel is open source and you can look at it. Um, so this is definitely, I definitely don't trust this on like Windows or Mac OS or any other operating system. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, you, you have to interact with Fed scheduler. You can't do that. It's not real-time safe. That's pretty much the end of story. You cannot use locks, end of, end of story. So it means C++ has exactly one real-time safe threat synchronization mechanism. And it's going to stay like this for probably the rest of time, which is the atomic. This is literally the only thing you can do. Uh, fortunately, you can do quite a lot of uh, stuff with the atomic. You can use it on its own, like you, if you're just an atomic int or atomic float or something like this. You have a real-time safe way of um, sharing a value with, between threads. You can use atomic as a building block to um, construct the log-free queue, which is, you know, some, somebody said about, some, somebody mentioned uh, log-free structure. So yes, you can. You can use this. You can you can write log free queues, log free stacks, things like that. Uh, they're always going to use third atomic as kind of the underlying synchronization primitive. You can uh, you can implement a spin lock with third atomic, which is actually a um, way in which you can do the try lock on the real time thread and lock on the non real time thread. That pattern you can actually implement in a real time safe way if you uh, if you use a spin lock instead of a mutex. And there is kind of the naive implementation of a spin log, which is just, you know, you spin on an atomic, on the value of an atomic until it changes from the other thread, which is a very wasteful thing because then the CPU core is just going to uh, be at 100% spinning, 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 and your battery is going to melt. Um, or you can um, have a more efficient implementation of this uh, using um, certain techniques um, like uh, exponential backoff. Um, and so I have a whole talk about just this, how to implement a spin lock like this at a uh, audio developer conference last year, which is called Using Locks at Real-Time Audio Processing Safely. So please check that out if you're interested. Um, OK, uh, if you do use the atomic, though, uh, you need to make sure that's actually uh, lock-free because um, the specification says it's so the atomic cannot introduce a data race, but it doesn't mean that it's always lock free. And lock free, that's the kind of property that you want to go for. So what you need to do is you need to check if it's lock free. So the way this works is that depending on what T uh, type you use, um, either your operate like sorry, your hardware, your CPU has native instructions for doing atomic load, atomic store, atomic compare and swap for that type. Um, and then the whole thing is going to be lock free. It's going to use like native CPU instructions for doing lock free compare exchange um, and load and store. Um, or your CPU doesn't have these instructions for that type that you're using. And then uh, what the uh, compiler is going to do in order to guarantee this no data race property is going to insert locks, which is exactly what you don't want. Now, if you use something like std atomic of int or std atomic of float, which is like fits into a word size of your system on a modern machine, then you're not going to have a problem uh, because CPUs have instructions for that. But uh, what happens if you use something a bit more complex, like uh, complex, <laughs> std complex double, and you want to have a std atomic of std complex double? 
Is that going to be real time safe? Well, I don't know. So what you need to do is you need to write the static assert, which basically checks if the atomic of that type is always going to be lock free, which means it's not going to be translated to something that is going to introduce these locks because you don't have native CPU support for that. And typically if your data type gets too big and you don't have instructions for that uh, on the CPU that you're using, then that static assert is going to fail. And actually it's kind of interesting because with this specific example, std complex double, which um, you know, in my machine is um, something like, uh, yeah, it's like two, two doubles, right? Uh, on my MacBook that I'm using to give this talk right now, this static assert um, succeeds, but on my PC, which is also an x64 architecture, the static assert fails. So uh, you need to be careful with this. Um, you need to um, basically write this static assert if you're using kind of interesting uh, types in there, or if you just want this to be portable in general, uh, you should always write the static assert to make sure that it's actually real-time safe. And in this uh, example, lock-free means it's going to be real-time safe. All right, so we're almost at the end of the talk. I have kind of one more, um, one more um, thing I want to talk about. Um, but before I get to that, are there any questions uh, so far? Hello? Far. So please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Sorry. Cool. 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 <laughs> All right. So we are almost at the end of the talk. Um, last topic, which is something fun that you might want to do in a C application, which is random numbers. Uh, I like random numbers. Uh, random numbers are useful. Um, you need them a lot. In audio, um, I have seen uh, a lot of the time people writing code like this. So something that you always um, kind of often need to do in audio um, is you want to generate random floating point numbers, so for example, between minus one and one or between zero and one in this case, uh, to generate noise, for example, or you might want to um, have like a humanizer effect or something like this. And obviously if you're writing a game, you want to, you want your monsters to be spawned in random locations and things like that. And so, you know, random numbers are often going to come up in this context of kind of real-time sensitive applications. And I have seen quite a lot of times um, in the wild um, code, which in this case was generating random floats between zero and one like this. Um, so there is actually a bug. Um, Klaus, uh, you're, you're on the call, right? Um, do you see the bug? <laughs> Anyone else see a bug? So I'll wait a couple of seconds until people um, have posted something. So I'm talking about an actual bug. So I'll give them a couple more seconds. OK, so okay, yeah, no. No one. <laughs> so, so this code actually, um, so you're supposed to um, return a random float in the semi-open interval zero and one. So which means zero is okay, but you can't return one. You have to return something that's smaller than one. But uh, this code can actually return uh, the number one, exactly, which um, actually um, funny because uh, it's one of those cases where you have a unit test and then one in a million times it actually fails and then it's a lot of fun to figure out why. So I have actually encountered this in production. Um, so this is not correct, but um, I'm not going to call, talk about the correctness of this. We're not talking about numerics here. We're talking about real-time safety. And um, so in that context, a std rant is just, I mean, I think just in general, std rant is just completely useless in my opinion, I'm sorry. But like, I, I would not want, I would not recommend anyone to use this for anything, basically, um, std rant. And it's not because it's a low quality random number generator, um, because we don't typically do cryptography here, right? We don't care about high quality random numbers if you're doing a game or audio processing or you know stuff like that. But there are you know at least uh, two other reasons why Stdrand is just a horrible choice for this. Um, and if you look at the um, at the specification at the standard um, of Stdrand, 
Uh, there are two things here. One is it says, well, it's not portable with unpredictable and oft questionable quality and performance, right? Uh, so non-portable is very unfortunate because that means um, it's going to ge generate, like if you, if you see it with the same thing, it's still going to generate a different sequence um, on every platform, which makes it very difficult to write unit tests for. Um, but then actually a lot worse for the purposes of this talk is there is this wonderful sentence in the standard saying, it is implementation defined whether the RAND function may introduce data races. And if you see anything like this in the standard, your alarm bell should go off and like, oh no. Like, actually what this means is, well, the standard library might um, call RAND uh, at some point somewhere else, maybe on a different thread. And then, you know, that might have global state. And then in order to, um, you know, make that global state threat safe, there's going to be a lock in there. So this specification allows and encourages um, such an implementation. So um, yeah, this is the stuff that you really got to watch out for. If you see anything like this in the standard, run away if you're, um, if you want to be real-time safe and never use anything like this. Um, so stdrand is definitely not real-time safe uh, in general. Um, but of course, um, stdrand is old and we're not supposed to use it anyway um, for good reasons. So since C++11, we do have a very comprehensive random number generator in the C++ standard. Uh, we have these three wonderful engines in the standard, Mazen Twister, Linear Conventional Engine, and Subtract with Carry Engine. Are they real-time safe? Hmm. <clears throat> so I didn't know, so I started digging. Um, so it turns out uh, there is this kind of specification in the standard which says all of these three engines, you know, if it's a standard conformant, you know, random number generator, then it fulfills these criteria. And it says that G paren paren, which is the call operator, which is the thing that's actually going to give you a new random number, has amortized constant complexity. And remember, this is the thing that we don't want to use because it's going to have constant time, like it's going to take the same time. Uh, most of the time, but every once in a while, it might take a lot longer. And that's exactly what we don't want because then we can't meet our deadline. And so um, I uh, wanted to understand um, why this is amortized constant complexity. And so I did what I often do. If I don't know something, I go to Twitter. Um, and um, so basically, it turns out that, for example, with um, Mazen Twister, which is, I think, the most commonly used um, random number generator out of the three that we have in the standard library. Turns out it has a huge internal state, uh, something like 624 uh, numbers. And then, um, you know, it's kind of advancing that state. It's probably relatively cheap-ish to do most of the time. But then once in a while, it might decide to recompute its whole internal state, and you have no idea how long that's going to take. So you don't want to run into that. So don't use Mazen Twister. Um, that's not real-time safe. Um, there are these two other engines. Um, actually, there is, for example, the linear congruential engine. And I started at the specification. And it actually gives the formula, like this is how a new uh, number is going to be uh, generated. Um, and that formula, if I stare at it, it's you know real-time safe, right? It's like a multiplication and addition, you know, stuff like this. So this is um, seems to be uh, real-time safe, so I would think that a um, reasonable implementation would just apply this formula. So linear congruential engine is um, fine, it's real-time safe if it's implemented like this. I've actually used linear congruential engine in production in audio code and it's fine. It's real-time safe uh, if it's implemented correctly. Uh, not, however, the most efficient random number generator you could use. Um, it's not the fastest one, it's not the most uh, kind of the cheapest one. Um, so there is one which is not in the standard library, which is called Zorshift. And Zorshift is a uh, very, very efficient uh, random number generator, which basically just is an OR combined with a bit shift. And if you want to make that cryptographically secure, you need to do a couple more operations, but we don't even want that, right? In audio or in games, you don't care about that. So it's basically just an OR and a bit shift. It's very, very um, efficient to use. It's, it can be optimized like very, very well on modern platforms. Um, so in my opinion, this is the best uh, random number generator for like stuff like real-time audio. Um, 
It's not in a standard library. It's not in a C++ standard at the moment. I think I should probably write a proposal to add it because I think it would be very useful. Um, but there are enough kind of third party implementations of this so you can go out and find one and, and use that. Um, so let's just assume uh, we have an implementation which has the same kind of interface um, as the other standard um, random number generators. Um, so it kind of just slots kind of into the machinery that we have in a standard. And now um, let's say you want to use this. So um, we um, now have this um, uh, Zor shift run, which is our engine. And we seed it with some random device. And actually, um, there's a bug here on the slide. Um, that we shouldn't, let me just fix it right here. Uh, we obviously shouldn't uh, create one of those things um, on the real-time thread because that's going to call said random device. Um, that is going to be a system call that's not real-time safe, so you don't want to do that. You want to create this thing up front and then just call it here, right? So, um, yeah, let's, this is a bug on the slide. I will amend it. Um, so. Um, yeah, you shouldn't create that um, random number generator on, on the real-time thread. But anyway, let's assume we have one of those um, and we seed it and um, then we just call it. And so uh, we want to use it to create our floats between 0 and 1, right? That's the task that we have. So how do we create, um, how do we create the floats, random floats between 0 and 1 in C++ and standard C++? We have these things called um, distributions. So we have a uniform int distribution and we have a uniform real distribution. That's the one that we need here. Um, so we create this uh, distribution. We tell it the bounds of our intervals, so like between zero and one, semi-open. And then the way it works, that we kind of just have to wrap our random number generator with this distribution object, um, and then just call the distribution object, um, and that's going to give us our new random numbers. Question, is this real-time safe? Or actually, other question. Um, what is the cost of this operation? Well, um, if we go to the standard, it says that, it just says basically this, the algorithms for producing each of the specified distributions are implementation defined. Um, so um, this is, um, very sad, right? Because again, it has these two problems. One is it's going to create a different sequence um, on every platform. So that's really unfortunate because we have these standard random number generators, right? So it's exactly defined what they do. You can have the same random number generator on Microsoft, on Clang, on GCC. They're going to um, generate exactly the same sequence if you see them with the same number. So it's great for unit tests. But if you just wrap that with a standard distribution, that's not going to be the case anymore. And actually, it's going to generate three different sequences on MSVC, Clang, and GCC, which is actually what's going on, which is, I think, very sad. Uh, but then the other bigger problem is actually it doesn't specify um, what this does. So it doesn't also specify what the complexity of this is. So it doesn't specify whether it can be implemented in a real-time safe way. And uh, whenever that's the case, so if you encounter facilities like this where it just don't say exactly what they like, how they implement it or what complexity they have, they just say, this is the result. Uh, you're going to actually have to dig in and understand what the algorithm does and how you would implement this thing in order to figure out if it's real time safe or not. And if you do that, uh, I'm not going to dive into this now because I've been talking for quite a while now, but like to make it short, um, the standard uniform distributions have amortized constant complexity. So they don't have constant complexity. And the reason for that is that they are allowed to. Uh, so they call the, the random number generator under the hood and they're allowed to discard the number that they got and create generate a new one, call it again. And in principle, at least in theory, uh, they're allowed to do this an unbounded amount of times. And um, there is a reason for this, um, which if you're into random number generators, is actually quite cool. I did not know this. I again went to Twitter and Peter Bindles actually explained to me why this is. Um, it's actually quite interesting. I'm not going to explain this now, but um, basically, a distribution can be either perfectly uniform, perfectly unbiased, or it can be constant time, but it cannot be both of those things. Um, and turns out you need to make a choice, and the standard ones go for perfectly uniform, perfectly unbiased, so they're not constant time. So you cannot use um, standard distributions if you want to be constant time. 
So what I ended up doing in my code is I ended up just doing this kind of simple uh, math again, where um, I am calling the kind of random number generator, which is real time safe if I use Zorshift. But instead of using the distribution, I just do some manual math with, you know, uh, kind of the distance between like min and max. And if, you, if you're working with floating point numbers, you typically have a division in there. If you are working with integers, you're going to have a modulo operator in there. Uh, but you, you kind of just do this and then you know um, this is going to definitely be constant time because it's just those operations every time around. Um, so that's going to always take the same amount of time to execute. Of course, this still has the bug that it might return the number one, which is not allowed because it's semi-open interval. So I did this like very simple hack here, which um, you know uh, just kind of nudge it down if it reaches that number, which it does very very rarely. Um, so that means it's this is not going to be um, obviously perfectly uniform, right? But um, you know, for my use case, this is good enough. Uh, it's kind of quick and dirty. Um, and that's real time safe and, and that's what I use. Maybe there is a better way of doing this. And if there is, please let me know. But this works in production. This is good. All right. So um, this is all the material I have. I hope I gave you a feeling of what it's like to use the standard library as opposed to kind of third party stuff uh, for this kind of stuff, this kind of real time stuff. Um, Mostly, um, so we live in this world where we kind of have to trust the implementation and read the standard and you know spend time understanding this. And mostly, it's okay to live in this world because um, you know if you know what you can and cannot use, you know it's actually typically quite high quality stuff in a standard library. We end up using a lot of custom implementations. We end up using a lot of the kind of standard library stuff. We end up not using like lots of game studios and you know audio companies and music tech and you know people like that. They end up re-implementing all of this in real-time safe ways and ending having custom implementations of this. Um, yeah, this is kind of the world we live in. Um, this is just what it is, but yeah, it's it's fun. So um, I guess one last thing is if I could have one thing in the standard um, to help a lot with this stuff, especially with using the standard library, is if there was some kind of attribute like annotation to mark something as real time safe so that we know um, that we can use it. And then you could um, actually go ahead and write tooling for this. You could go to um, something like Clang or you could have a static analyzer like the stuff that you know, Phil is, for example, working on like their products, um, uh, static analyzers. They could go in and, and like make sure that um, if you call a real time safe function, it itself also only calls real time safe functions inside. So you could do lots of kind of really nice tooling around this if you had this kind of annotation. We don't have that. We don't really have even a way of defining what that means really in the standard. And if you try to do that, it turns out actually they're like it's getting more complicated as it always does. There's actually there's lock free, which is kind of one thing, which is not going to try to acquire a lock, but it still might wait on a kind of spin lock. Then there's wait free, which means you know at least one thread is going to make uh, progress at all times. Um, uh, with this, sorry, this is lock free. Like at least one thread is going to always make progress. The others might spin. Then it's wait free, which means the thing that you're doing is going to make progress and it's not going to even spin on anything. It's going to just run through. And so that's going to be kind of a stronger version of real time safe. And then it's branch free, which is like the ultimate thing, which is like the same instructions are going to be executed every time. It still you know, doesn't guarantee that the execution time, the physical execution time is going to be the same because you have things happening on a hardware level. You have like instruction level parallelism and CPU pipelines are very complicated and stuff like this. But anyway, we don't have any of the stuff. Maybe this is something for the future. I'm done talking. Um, a lot of people have helped me putting this material together and helping me understand all of this. Um, I want to call out specifically those five people who have spent quite a lot of time sitting down with me and explaining stuff to me. So thank you very much to Fabian, Peter, Matthias, David, and Pablo. I've learned a lot from you. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Um, that's how you do real-time programming with a C++ standard library. Thank you very much for, and um, yeah, are there any more questions at this point? There are indeed. So first of all, I should say thank you a lot uh, for the talk. There is two more questions. Um, first one, is a perfectly unbiased, unbiased distribution important for audio in the first place? No, not the use cases that I'm aware of. 
which is why I'm using this hack, which just, you know, if it's one, just return something that's not one. And that, I mean, I don't know, there is, there might be a use case where you care about that, but I, I haven't encountered any in real life so far. We're not doing cryptography here, right? We're not doing uh, some kind of like Markov chain stuff where we have like millions of data points. We don't really care about that. Right. Okay, and then there's a question which might actually lead into a longer discussion. I still pose uh, the question, ask the question, um, but feel free to just postpone this into the after talk, talk chat. If okay. You um, so how do you make sure that the execution time of your code is below a certain maximum time? So example, given 10 milliseconds uh, in the example, if in your uh, beginning uh, uh, example in the beginning. So is this more like a summary of your talk? Uh, you can sure? you can you ask the question again? Okay. So how do you make sure that the execution time of your code is below a certain maximum time? Right. So typically what you have is you have a bunch of stuff and then you have this like top level processing callback, which I'm just going to call the whole processing pipeline. That's how it is in audio. I guess in games, it's a little bit different. Um, but like, I guess it's the same. You want to generate a frame and then you just have thousands of things that need to happen in order to do that. And the sum, the sum of this, of these operations needs to take less time than um, your frame rate or your audio frame rate or your whatever it is. So how do you do that? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, you do what I just talked about, and then you measure, you know, you look at the CPU load, for example. Like in, in audio, you have this like regular callback, right? So if you... Um, if you then let your audio processor run and you have like a, you don't have anything running really, and then you have like a 50% CPU load, you know that uh, your like the actual processing callback takes up half of the interval between two subsequent callbacks, right? And then you look for spikes, and then if you have a spike, then you're not real time safe. You did something wrong. So um, yeah, this is kind of this is kind of what you do. And the, at the end, it's exactly like uh, any other performance problem you just measure, right? Um, or you don't. And like with small stuff, you can just kind of rely on the fact that it's probably not going to take very long. But like you have to still measure the whole thing, obviously, at the end. Which is a great. I don't know. So yeah. um, uh, Kilian, if, if you're interested in more details, join us in the after talk chat. This is, I believe, a perfect um, uh, start for, for a discussion. Yeah, I mean, I could do a whole other talk about yes. how do you measure things, how you benchmark things, how exactly. do, what does CPU load actually mean, and like, ah, uh, it's it's like, but it's it's a very it's a completely orthogonal, I think, aspect. This was about the standard and like how can you reason about the standard if you are under time constraints, basically. All right, and then um, we have another question. Um, earlier, you mentioned system calls is a problem with real time code. Clearly, um, yeah. they are often unbounded in runtime. But yes. the US could still reschedule your threats, so it is a case that let uh, a case of let's pray, and hope it is, if it's good enough on Windows, etc. So uh, yeah, there's a rescheduling of a threat. Is this a problem? I mean, people do this stuff in production. It's fine sometimes. Um, um, like I don't know. It really depends on exactly what you're talking about because. If you're on this real-time thread, um, you can kind of you're kind of relying on the operating system to schedule it correctly, unless you have this problem of you're waiting on a mutex and you get this priority inversion and then you're screwed. But yeah. in general, you can rely on on um, like that real-time thread, or it's not really a real-time thread. It's like a real-time in quotes thread, so it's like a high priority thread. Uh, you can rely on that working reliably, but if you, as soon as you depend on other threads, basically all bets are off. And unless you have a very specific case where you know what happens, which you might have, um, you, I wouldn't go near that and Perfect. just use the techniques that I kind of talked about. And else, Lucas, please join us in the after talk chat, also discussion. All right, so thank you very much. Let's have a couple of minutes break, approximately 15 minutes. So at approximately uh, 7.55, Central European time. Phil will start with his talk. Okay, see you in 15 minutes. Thank you, Klaus. See you soon.